this will be the last session for today. And um, the topic for this uh, um, discussion will be ethics and morality when encouraging stu uh, students to start a new venture. And it seems like we already have discussed that question of ethics in the in last session. So <laughs> and uh, before introducing the, the session in, in itself, I will only briefly present the, the discussants. Uh, the, and all of them are very, very experienced when it comes to organizing, running, uh, entrepreneurship programs and courses. Uh, we have Paula Kure, who uh, is professor at uh, Aalto University, Diamantu Politis from Lund University, we have Magnus Klofstein from Linköping University, and we have Mats uh, Lundqvist from Chalmers, and uh, myself, I'm uh, Hans Landström from Stenkung Jonsson Center for Entrepreneurship at Lund University. Um, I will, uh, before I will ask you to, uh, the, the standard uh, question about who you are and why you are interested in entrepreneurship education, uh, I will say that, 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 I mean, one of the characteristics and one of the main characteristics of entrepreneurship is the issue of risk and uncertainty, innovation and, and, and so on. That is something that, that we all, maybe, maybe, after the last session, maybe we all agree on is a, a key issue for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in, in that respect. And that raised a couple of questions uh, in the sense that how are we introducing risk and uncertainty into our education programs? But it also raised the question about that the, the issue of risk and uncertainty also may, may create failures. And uh, not least when it comes to programs with the aims of encouraging students to start their own businesses. And we can raise the question about the ethic issue of letting a student starting businesses fail and, and so on. And it's also a, 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 an issue of an, in, in, in an interrelated question of how can we learn from these failures. So that is the three main issues, if we time will permit, that we will try to raise during this, uh, this seminar. Uh, how to introduce risk and uncertainty in our education, the ethical issue of, of having failures, and what can we learn from failures. So that is the introduction. So now I, I will let uh, our panelists uh, present themselves, also answering the question, why are they involved in entrepreneurship education? Should we start from the left? <laughs> uh, hello, my name is uh, Magnus Klostian. I'm a, a professor of entrepreneurship at Linship University and also the founding director of the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, I may be involved in, in, in m if you take myself, I mean, many ways involved in, in training uh, people who want to start firms. I mean, I had done that for almost 20 years, both when, when it comes to startups and when it comes to also growth firms. Um, I also uh, um, introduced basically the, the uh, first course in entrepreneurship at our university. It was 94. And it has grown uh, in in number of courses, in number of students over the years, and uh, also become some kind of all eater in the entrepreneurship field, um, running courses for undergraduate students, for PhD students, etc. Also being involved in on the international arena when it comes to a similar uh, relationship. I mean, uh, I've been uh, since the past two years uh, a member of the OECD uh, group of of reviewing entrepreneurial university, developing a a framework for, for, for leaders of universities to become more entrepreneurial. And also, uh, which was very fun, uh, last year I led a group of, of um, yeah, 15 uh, rectors from the university school or secondary school in entrepreneurship. You know, I and mean, they got a lot of influences from outside and they're going to implement entrepreneurship into the gymnasium and they have, don't have any clue of how to do it, you know. 
And at the universities, we have been doing this for many, many years. I mean, at least 20 years. So we have some experience and might we can support the school system in that also in some way. So, so um, why I'm doing entrepreneurship? Um, many reasons. Uh, one thing is to fill in a knowledge gap. When I was a student once, we didn't never talk about entrepreneurship. We never talked about what's happening in the early development process. We talk the start of, of ventures for given. And uh, I'm feeling this a little bit like that today also. And see people grow and develop is also very encouraging when you are doing this. You know? So it's a fun factor also, lust factor, as we say in Swedish. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Diamanto. Okay, my name is Diamanto Politis. I'm associate professor at Sten Kujonsson Center here at Lund University. I'm also the program director for the one uh, for the international master program in entrepreneurship for one of the tracks uh, that are focusing on uh, new venture creation. Um, I have been here since 2013 here at Lund University and why I'm interested in entrepreneurship in general. I'm very curious about what actually uh, uh, does it mean to be entrepreneurial? How do entrepreneurs learn and back to 2000, well, 2000, when I started my PhD uh, uh, doctoral thesis, I was actually asking the question, why do some people uh, are more successful in recognizing and exploiting opportunity while others are less successful? So there was a driving force for me to trying to figure out how do we learn entrepreneurship and how can we, specifically, how can we teach entrepreneurship in educational settings? Thank you. Paula? Ah, my motive is um, due to the last recession, early 90s in Finland, uh, when what happens after this recession, we lost a quarter of our entrepreneurs, not uh, enterprises or companies or firms per se. And I was amazed uh, at that, that time I was an entrepreneur and tried to help those companies to survive and those entrepreneurs to survive. And I was uh, um, confused how our government and policymakers assumed that they can help uh, small uh, businesses in our society. So I thought that, okay, if they have no clue whatsoever what entrepreneurship is about and what are those small businesses and how to run them, so there's a huge need for research. And therefore, I started when we got the first professorship in that field in Finland. So I started to make research on that. But for some reason, then I got mixed up with our other education and a PhD in, in that field, and then also in business, in entrepreneurship. And it means in practice that with these um, competencies combining uh, entrepreneurship and education in order to provide. Uh, entrepreneurship competencies. I, I try to talk about entrepreneurship competencies. Not entrepreneurial, not enterprising, but to cover the whole field. Um, has some uh, impact on our societies. I throw hope, Frederick, not in that direc direction you are talking about, but on the contrary. So, but the problem, problems of um, combining educational theories into entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship into educational theories. That has been a sort of way to approach these needs in our society. Thank you, Paula and Mats. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, I took my PhD in 96 in the area of managing product development. And there I saw in my PhD that some companies, they had really fun in their teams when they developed new products and the products were more successful and they m did well on the market and others had less fun and the products did less good on the market. <laughs> um, and I studied teams very much and interdisciplinary or cross-functional teams um, in the 90s. And when this idea came from another professor that we should start a school of entrepreneurship taking care of ideas that were not taken care of from research, innovations or inventions we can call them and perhaps match them into the hands of, of entrepreneurial students. I said, well, that's great because I might have some kind of a pedagogy uh, stemming from my own um, um, 
PhD process. Of course, this was industry, and, and I wasn't a pedagogue. I was uh, just uh, someone who looked into a lot of knowledge management and community of practice kind of literature. And I felt, you know, I, I think we can at least emulate and do this into some kind of an organizational innovation. Uh, and that's been my interest to prove that you can create, uh, I would call it today, a lab where students come out very happy, just like the successful projects uh, or the people around the product development projects did in the 90s. They come out really happy and they felt they learned a lot more than they would otherwise. You have an innovation or a company that grows and gets successful. And the most fun part, which took me like 15 years, was that this is a lab that you can look upon as a research lab. So we can now generate good, good research um, about uh, entrepreneurial education and entrepreneurial learning. So it's the Kinder Egg I felt like I wanted to create. One part of the Kinder Egg, the, the research part, is basically exploding now. And thanks to we're here and having fantastic debates. And I think that's, so, so now I would say I'm not into, you know, you talk a lot about the higher education should be a, a research-based, but I, I'm talking more about education-based research, really, you know, that, that we, we can study what we do in, in action in our lab when we're actually in the early nascent phase when ventures are being formed and entrepreneurs are being born. It's a fantastic place to be. It's really encouraging. Um, so I th that's why I did it. Um, actually, now the, the incubator that we had to create is, is uh, uh, number one in Sweden and this uh, number two in, in Europe and number seven, so eight, eight in the world. Um, so um, I guess we've proven that it works to, to, to think more about what competencies you want to develop to refer to uh, you and also Mats who talked a lot about that, that trying to put people who have entrepreneurial intent uh, or uh, mindsets into a driver's seat, giving them innovations and nurturing them actually gives a bigger effect than if you don't do that. So, so um, that was my answer. Thank you, Matt. And now you know the panelists. And let's start with the first issue in, in that respect. If we assume that uh, entrepreneurship is very much characterized by people that can manage or take risk, manage uncertainty, uh, to be innovative, creative in, in, in that respect. How do we really introduce risk and uncertainty in our education, in our courses, in our programs? If this is so important in, in, in for entrepreneurs. And I, I think I know that Paula has some thoughts about that. So I will start to ask you what's your opinion or ideas about that. Thank you. Not an easy, <laughs> not an easy question. However, if it is really interesting, and I have to return to the first um, panel when we were talking about the concepts and how we define things. Now, when we talk about risk, we don't have only one definition for that, but on the contrary, at least uh, we have found three different definitions that lead to quite different pedagogy and uh, uh, the first one that is probably the most known is the Kahneman and Tversky research in this area and it focuses on uncertainty. So uncertainty basically means that we don't know something and this not knowing brings us um, uh, uh, risk. And Kahneman and Tversky, they try to see uh, uh, which, how can we make best possible choices among different existing uh, alternatives. So basically, when we talk about entrepreneurship, we, th this is so limited idea about action-oriented. Uh, opportunity exploitation, creation, recognizing, however you would like to define it. So then there are those that talk about insecurity. And this broader idea, there is those who sort of mix these two, and, and then finally there are action-oriented insecurity definitions. And if you look at the pedagogy itself, for me it's a quite different world 
how we defined risk involved in our studies. Unfortunately, Kahneman and Tversky is not very attractive when it comes to how to make the best possible choice. I hope Frederick didn't mean that when talking about choices, uh, but when we talk about insecurity, it means that we uh, sort of need to behave, uh, as Alan put it, in complexity. But Alan talked about uncertainty and complexity. For me, it's complexity and what I learned from fuzzy logics, complexity. So it means complexity means that we have a different kind of ideas, but complexity, what we have is a complicated. <laughs> and in such a situation we are living, it, it um, includes opportunities uh, and um, these opportunities has to be exploited. But how to let our students to be in that uh, complexity? It's a dilemma. If we, um, when we talk about, when we were listening about Gustav in the first panel, he was talking about the need for stability in classroom. So the question is, should we provide stability? That means uh, uh, certainty somehow in the classroom, or should we expose our students into insecurity? and see that they survive, and some of them even start to enjoy it. And these kind of things, at least, we've identified uh, as a three-phase process in different contexts when we studied that. One was confusion in the beginning. Then it was action to overcome this confusion. And finally, it was learning risk-taking competencies. And what was a sort of delighted finding for us was that the outcome was not related to the uh, uh, original uh, face and feelings about uncertainty. So this encourages us to the idea that we actually can teach risk taking competencies. We will come back to how, but are there any reactions, reflections on that uh, in from Magnus? And um, I can say, I mean, very interesting. I mean, it's, to be honest, uh, when I'm writing up a schedule for a course or independently for our training, those who are going to start or just a traditional credit-based course, I'm honest in saying that I don't have any, any, any um, sell with, with, with insanity or risk uh, per se. But uh, in the same time, you want to create confidence by the students, you know. I mean, of course, you have the personal risk and you have the business risk, if you're talking about these two, very simple. Uh, and um, in a system like Sweden, what is the personal risk of, of, of failing in a, in a venture? I mean, I mean, we have a security system that is not so bad, you know. So, I mean, Basically, it's no personal risk at all, you know. I mean, maybe you're losing your face, but, but that's, that's a completely different thing, you know. But starting a firm, if we're talking about that, it is a risk because the risk of not being anything in the future is very big. If you're looking at two very uh, well-established concepts in entrepreneurship theory, business development is the liability to newness and liability to smallness, you know. I mean, if you're new and different, it's difficult to, to get attention and, and get onto the market, you know, with, you, with your idea. And if you're small, you are also you know, a disadvantage to the larger uh, established organizations. So um, I think um, I think we're coming to that also, Hans. Uh, I will not uh, bring that up now, but they are saying that that we try to develop good or informative cases about this. And I can maybe come into that when we talk about failure later on. But, but, but uh, so okay. Yeah, Martin, mm -hmm. how do yeah. we in Lundi introduce the ideas of uncertainty, complexity, uh, and so on? You know? I think one way is actually to introducing the entrepreneurial process. What does it mean? I mean, within that process, we know that there are several uncertainties that 
entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs need to consider. But I think one thing also is to relate it to, to the specific uh, outcomes that can be uh, perceived or uh, resulting from this uh, risk-taking behavior, if you would like to to call it like this, but is is to 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 provide students to be comfortable to um, move out from the comfort zones because I think there is a, uh, I mean, uh, the perceptions of doing something differently uh, and trying out to improve performance to to. To, to perform better or to engage in exploring new things, new ways of doing things. And if we can relate this process to some kind of learning uh, outcomes, I think that could be one way of uh, handling uh, the risk uh, situation. But I mean, we can also, of course, introduce it as a concept and, and what does it mean I within entrepreneurship processes. Mm -hmm. Mats? So um, I think this. I think actually, Fredrik brought up this a little bit. You know, if if you if you apply to a program, with, and you know when you apply that this is partly a place where you will be asked to take some initiative and be outside of your comfort zone, and then 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 that's one thing. If you're not aware of it, and somebody suddenly pushes you out in in the outside your comfort zone, then it's another thing. So let let me be very clear. When I talk, it's about a program where people apply, and it's pretty clear. Uh, what it is that they're engaging into. Um, and w once that premise is set and they have really convinced themselves and us that they want to be part of a program, then, then uh, we actually ask them to jump into the, to the swimming pool. And even though they might not know how to swim yet, that, that's basically what we do because we think that's a more effective way of learning to swim or to learn how to bike is to jump on a bike, right? That's, that's, uh, that's what it means to be truly action-based. Um, and, and of course we take it then as it goes and we have a lot of r uh, ways to, to allow them to grow. And the, the, um, the deal then that, that also they, they have with us is that we very early say that uh, only 30%, which is the same I learned today in Lund's program, will actually continue doing a business. So you're, you're here and it's during your education, you're risking nothing as long as you make your academic deliveries, you'll get a really nice grade. And, 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 and then um, history now says that, that you're very attractive on the labor market. So, so, I mean, we've done it extremely easy, taking away so many you know, thresholds in order for them to, to actually jump into to the water or jump onto the bike, which is what we're asking them to do, and which many of them really haven't done much before. So they are, they are really struggling, especially the first half year with the... With, uh, um, the transformation from having had a programmatic type of education all their life, because we're talking 23, 24 year olds, right? And suddenly we're asking them to work in teams and to deal with team dynamics and, you know, have, have, have all these conflicts that, that comes from, from, from solving uncertain innovation uh, duties and stuff like that. And, and we're saying, you know, this is, this is gradual transformation towards dealing with more and more uncertainty. And they whine a bit, uh, but we then talk with them, and, and uh, gradually uh, the, the frog is not aware of that the, it's cooking, right? It's warm and nice in that little, in that little, uh, yeah. So that's 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 the way. So it's a, you can I think that was kind of what you said. Mm -hmm. You can't really explain what it means to not be able to swim and be in water, mm -hmm. but at least there is some confidence. There is some contract, and we always pull them up in the last second if they're about to drown, of course. So that's. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mats, Mats, Mats you, you, you know what, what we're calling our entrepreneurship training program sometimes. We call it for Flight Academy for Penguins. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so. Flap harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 I can understand that, that confidence uh, to, uh, was a, a concept that you brought up uh, uh, several times. Mm. Give me two examples of how you educate confidence. Uh, tools that you will use in order to build confidence in your programs? When you talk about confidence, I, I, I think I'm 
I'm not quite comfortable with that. Okay. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it was you that mentioned it first, but <laughs> no, but it was what is expected. Okay. And it makes a dilemma when it comes to uh, risk taking and insecurity. And that is the challenge for teachers. And that is what I've been struggling with my teacher teams uh, when they want to bring more security and more confidence. But what I like a lot is the self-efficacy and team efficacy concepts. Because uh, it's a terrible thing for teacher to put them into the water and believe that they can survive somehow. Or if they failure, there's somebody that helps them out in their own team, not by you but by somebody else. And that is, I think, pedagogic dilemma that I'm not sure that all teachers share. Because what I've experienced in my career, and retired, by the way, you said, no, not anymore. So, is that when you let students to be in confusion phase, other students don't tolerate it. And they try to draw them and help them to come up, which means in practice that their self-efficacy is not actually improved as much as when they realize that they can manage, they can do that. And that is the feeling they want to continue in the future. But of course, students are different, teachers are different. And I don't know, sometimes, Perhaps it's better to help them or, or it's uh, struggling. But uncertainty, insecurity is the idea. And for me, what has been utmost important is that teacher is not defining the goals, mm -hmm. but the students are doing that. Teacher is not choosing the teams, Oops. but students are forming them because then they are responsible for the cho uh, choices but it doesn't mean that you are not helping them constantly when they are struggling they can come to you you can help okay this was not a good idea so let's make a new decision let's make a new compositions and that is also very difficult for teachers Usually they say, this is your team, you are supposed to keep that team and success with that team. In entrepreneurial pedagogy, we, we do contrary. We let them make choices, we let them experience, and then we help them if they need help. And they can change the teams, the goals, constantly. Mats. All right, uh, so... Uh, I think you know this, Paula, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> that we, uh, we give them innovations and we also have arranged marriages when it comes to what the teams should be. So we don't trust them being able to marry each other even. And it's, it's coming out of them the, their own wish because you have political games otherwise when you have a very high, high potential group uh, that are all selected by us. So, so we've learned that we in the end need to, to actually form the team, but we do it after having asked them a lot. But it's like... There's always someone who's not. I mean, there's always someone that's difficult to put into the team, so we need to make that decision eventually, and that then gives us a big responsibility. And we've taken that over the years; it's worked. We have we, um, and it's same the same thing when they they see my chose these inventions that we have handed out to them. We have a gross list of like 20 every year, and they pick 12 or 11. Uh, but it's still, in the end, we are providing this list of inventions. So we've broken those two rules, and we've, we've known we've broken those rules, and we've proven that you can find, find ways that actually works. Um, uh, and it creates a huge uh, system then of, of mechanisms that I don't have time to go into now, but I think I would li like to make the point that I've come convinced that and I would refer to Frederick again, and this heroic entrepreneur. I mean, I mean, he's not really into entrepreneurship education, let's be fair, but he's coming with good inputs. I chose to 
look upon entrepreneurship as team-based already back in 97. And I really still believe that's very important. I think if we have too much choice, we actually might be reinforcing typical male individualistic uh, behavior. Uh, uh, and there's all these other things that I don't believe in value-wise. Uh, I want our students to understand that they actually need to marry each other to partner and love inequality, or not inequality, sorry, diversity, inequality, sorry, I diversity, and all these things. And, and we put pressure to them because we know they will be humbled. Many of them have been A students all their life, and they're so great, and they're so cool. And by having this mechanism, they actually grow a lot more and reflect a lot more and stuff like that. So I'm proud that we do the way we do, but it requires a lot of mechanisms, OK, in order to, to avoid any kind of, of uh, problem. Um, and I can come back to that. There's a Mag television Ma program Magnus. nowadays, isn't there? Marriage before meeting, or only the first mm, okay. <laughs> meeting or something. Mm. Magnus. I mean, we yep. We're talking about uh, team building now. I mean, I mean, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, I can just relate that to uh, my PhD course in entrepreneurship. I've been running it for almost 10 years now. 150 PhD students have been through it. And uh, we discovered after a while that, that PhD students came, on, ca came into the course from all parts of the university, from the medical school, from the philosophical faculty, from the, from the technical faculty, most of them, of course. But, but uh, they are uh, a mix of people, you know. And we try to do something um, uh, very interesting there. We try to mix teams of, of, of um, multidisciplinary groups. And, and uh, we have also a lot of foreign PhD students coming in from Iran, Pakistan, India, China, whatever, you know. And um, we say that take out an idea you want to focus on and do something about it. Take it to some kind of reality, you know. And they had to write down a, 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 a very short description of the idea on the whiteboard. And then you, got, you have 15 to 20 students, you have 15 to 20 ideas on the whiteboard. You know. Then have to vote for which one do they want to work with. So one, one two, three points. And th these ideas that get most points, you have to, to rely on. And then I just leave them for 15 minutes, and they have to group themselves in groups of three. And there you see a big difference between cultures. You know. The Swedes go directly to the, I want to be there. It doesn't really matter for me, you know, if it's good or bad, you know, or if I know it or not, you know. But uh, for some cultures, you know, it's extremely difficult to, 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 to choose because I don't know anything about this. I'm very uncomfortable, you know. So then you come into a situation where you have a, where you have a group of very different, different opinions, you know. So you have to push them into the groups. But after a while, you see that they're performing so well, you know. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a cultural issue when it comes to the comfort zones and the... I mean, you can't, uh, you can't ask, the, the, uh, ask the students about, have, you, have this course raised your self-confidence? You know, they will not uh, answer that question. But, but uh, I think you have to deal with this also, because we're meeting a lot of different type of people in, in, in these courses, independently if it's PhD courses or, or undergraduate courses. So I think it's a very important issue. I will open mm. up uh, mm. for the audience, and uh, mm -hmm. I see a couple, of, I think <laughs> Bengt was the first here. To Thank you, a very interesting discussion here. Uh, I think uh, there are two different things to accept, that entrepreneurship actually is a collective phenomenon, and another thing to push students, or not pushing them, into teams. Uh, I think also, if I remember the GEM study, that Sweden's pretty high on intrapreneurship, talking about prefixes. Isn't that, um, uh, in such a context, if we accept uh, the role, important role of intrapreneurship or corporate entrepreneurship, organizational entrepreneurship in Sweden, <coughs> isn't th in that perspective, I can agree with, the, with you, Mats, that's fine to push them into teams because that's exactly what will happen when they get employed and want to be, be uh, stay enterprising individuals. They have to accept that they are linked to others and they can't build their own personal network, which an independent, autonomous entrepreneur can do. Have I interpreted? Well, everything except the last part. Uh, I, I, I don't see good uh, innovators or entrepreneurial people that are within that are embedded uh, operating with just corporate networks i truly believe that you know even the big firms need 
the type of competency that our programs develop, and especially the ability to network way beyond your own borders, talking to all kinds of potential customers or, or suppliers or listening into trends or social developments and being engaged in all kinds of communities, I think is super important. So I buy in, let me, so, so, so I, I, I would just like to say I totally agree with you that perhaps our model at Chalmers is even consciously uh, built upon what I would call an Audrech way, a knowledge intensive environment is basically one big super network. We have so many links with Ericsson and, and, and Volvo and Chalmers is highly integrated with these corporations. So it is pretty embedded, the type of training we do and therefore it makes sense to, to match the team so that they get this uh, uh, insight that they also have to look upon themselves as, as uh, not just independent entrepreneurs, but all the time relating to all these other actors. But having said that, we really want them to think network-wise very broadly. That's extremely important for us. Stop there. Well, no. <laughs> uh, already 20 years ago, I wrote a paper with Donald Jort, and we, ha we had exactly the argument you present. But well, that's one thing, that you want to teach like that way, that you're uh, apply a normative perspective here, but does it work like that also in Swedish companies? I mean, that's an empirical question. And has, do you have any some sort of proof for your argument here that they are building both internal and external networks? Well, very quick. I, th I think I think there's absolutely room for for much more of this networking among normal employees in big Swedish companies. But that's also one of the reasons we have a program that will be inspiring in that direction. So our people, our students, having learned to deal with uncertainty and build personal networks, hopefully are infusing those kind of values into Swedish corporate structures. That's my way of looking at it. So I think it's lacking, but, but it's, uh, it's needed. Yeah, I think so too, but I mean, it's still a matter of proving that. Yep. Jona, okay. could you take the microphone from Bengt? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I'm block sure my it's going to get much better, though. Um, I also have a question to Mats. Okay. Um, <laughs> related. I'll try to be short. Go, I mean, as, as uh, you started out discussing about risk and uncertainty, and you now claim that your students learn to deal with uncertainty, mm. and I'm actually wondering, when I listen to you, uh, in my experience uh, of entrepreneurship education, I think you take out two of the main learning events for handling uncertainty, and that is, firstly, you give them an idea rather than have them go through this highly uncertain process of, of finding an idea. And secondly, even this team forming uh, process is, is some kind of learning to deal with uncertainty. So I'm wondering, do they really learn to handle uncertainty? Okay. <laughs> I don't have my mic on anymore, yes I do. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I would say yes, but I didn't know that in the beginning because remember we started it as a tech transfer mechanism. So the, the idea that inventions should be brought out by students was like a foundational. But after, th after all these years, I can say, it's like, uh, you know, in psychology, you have a boundary object, it's like a teddy bear. So yeah, it gives them certainty to hold on to an invention, but very quickly they start to effectuate on it. And it's not at all the same thing after a while. So they build their values into it. So it's like a starting point to make them s jump into the ocean, but then they take it all other places. When it comes to, being a high, neurotic high uh, overachiever and being put together with other uh, in a team, that's pretty stressful. It's probably the most uncertainty driving thing. So it's tough to be there. So I would say it's very uncertainty oriented. I would. Alan? Just a couple of ob mm. so Can you hear me? I don't know. A couple of observations. Um, th there is a distinction academically, conceptually, between uncertainty and risk. You know, risk is something that you can measure. Um, and the problem is always that people um, treat uncertainty as risk. I mean, if you just look at um, uh, those of you who read The Black Swan will realize uh, the difference and the, the chaos that resulted in the capital markets, the bank problem, because they treated uncertainty uh, on risk models which economists built and, and of course, it was uncertainty they were facing, not risk. So risk is something that insurance companies and pension funds and et cetera can... Uh, so risk and uncertainty are actually different. And teaching people... I mean, one of the problems of the business plan 
is that there's an underlying assumption that you develop, you reduce the risk by having the business plan. In fact, all the evidence demonstrates that, that the the reality is never like the business plan. If you stick to it, you, you, you're doomed in most cases. That, that's one point. The second point, though, is, is that a failure that you mentioned, that, that, that basically it's, it's a myth, unfortunately, that, that um, in about 10% of businesses start and 11% in the, in the terminate, but that's the economists measuring the, the termination of a business. And you have to think about three things. What happened to the legal status of the business? It terminated. What happened to the person? And what happened to the business? And you know the answer is that something like only eight, uh, 12% rather, of businesses that are involuntary liquidated or are bankrupt are actually failures. The rest, in the formal sense of failure, the rest are actually businesses that have closed mm -hmm. for various reasons, some of which are, they don't meet the expectations mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. So you, you, you really are mm -hmm. treating, treating the whole thing yeah, far yeah, too severely. Yeah. In fact, it's a learning environment, setting up a business, and, and something like 85% of people treat it as a learning environment and go on to do different things afterwards. Picking up on on, uh, on that issue, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as you indicated, the uncertainty and risk mm -hmm. and, and whatever will will uh, uh, encourage mm -hmm. failures in one way or on another. And it's a question of, on, on, other on, on the other hand, you can say that you can learn a lot from from these failures. And that will be the next mm -hmm. issue: is saying in what, uh, how do you include? learning from failures in your education, uh, Magnus. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Alan. There's a lot of uh, discussion about we using success cases in our, our, our uh, lectures. You know. and I think it's very difficult to write up a, a proper su success case in <laughs> entrepreneurship and early business development. Because uh, most of the cases are, uh, when you're writing up a success case, you're looking backwards, you know, and you have not been part of the process when you're writing up the case. So in most cases, you have a failure, you know. I mean, uh, and another dimension of that is that if, you, if, if you're writing up a case which is longitudinal, you will see that it might be also successful as well as very unsuccessful. If you have a broad uh, picture, as you introduced, Libby Talon, you have, a, for instance, the entrepreneur, you have a strong driving force, you have a, a competent team and so on, you know. And uh, you have a very novel idea, which is uh, bad timing. It might be that, that, that you, you're not uh, treating your customers well, for instance. You're, you are very uh, successful in attracting external financing, but it doesn't help your business develop so much because you fail anyway. So, I mean, I think you, when you... When you Dealing with failures in, in case studies, you should have this, uh, to say, a broad perspective of what failure could be. And uh, it might be so simple that you try to combine two business models under the same umbrella and try to explain that what could happen if you do that, you know. And what could happen if you are overfinanced, for instance, you know. In some way, you would say that, okay, this venture has a lot of venture capital, big success, you know. But in the long term, it might be the opposite, you know. So, so I think we, we need to take in these nuances into to the failure discussion. Mm -hmm. Any mm -hmm. comments on? on, on yeah, mm -hmm. I, I can actually agree mm -hmm. with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I think also that something that we need to take into consideration when teaching entrepreneurship is to include this failure perspective as a natural part of the learning process, a natural part of learning entrepreneurship, because we, we are quite used to uh, invite guest lecturers that are successful entrepreneurs, let them talk about the successful stories. I think that here we have a quite important role to play to really invite successful people or unsuccessful people. But I think in general, if we look upon um, experienced entrepreneurs, they have during the journey have at least experienced some business failure and talk about them. and. Also, what we can do is to, to, to introduce uh, how we uh, attribute toward failure, how we treat failure, because I think uh, since childhood, childhood, we're actually quite used to, 
to, to take the blame if something fail, because someone take someone has to take the responsibility, and in, in these places it's, it's the entrepreneurs that take some uh, responsibility. But if we could see how, how different kind of experiences that have failed in some sense could also be ver uh, valuable experiences for the learning. Uh, so, but I think also that that various kind of cost here. We are talking about the psychological cost, we are talking about the financial cost that actually the entrepreneurs are also experiences, uh, and also the social cost. I mean, how, how, do we act how do we treat people that have failed in some sense? We, we have some kind of stigmatization regarding failure. I think it's that, that is really important to, to bring in into entrepreneurship education in some sense. To, to look upon that in a, in a more positive way. And one tool to work with this is to, to, to have this learning journal, for instance, that where they writing down the things that they have done, done through the, the program or through the years that they, uh, and see the critical things that they have experienced perhaps was also the most important part for them to develop and progress. So I think, I think it's a quite interesting thing that we can bring into uh, and also, as Caroline talked about the, the literature about the, 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 myths, um, the myths of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think we have quite glorious view of successful entrepreneurs that are making a lot of money. But I, I mean, there are also other kinds of entrepreneurship that are less successful. But so I think we need to have some balanced view of it when uh, teaching. Paul, in, in uh, I don't know how much I like the word concept failure because it's its experience among others and it's a natural part of any process whatsoever we are dealing with. So that was my point that if something is not working out, let's let's change it. So so basically therefore it's so easy to follow your ideas. Uh, so <coughs> That's the point, but how to provide uh, this kind of experience is, is that we, we really need to start to act even in our courses in order to experience this kind of not working out situations. So I fully understand your idea that you want to success and therefore you put all your efforts in order to form the teams that can work successfully together looking at your records globally, you, you, you are a huge success as a program. So I think that when it comes to make a failure, when you have a huge investments, it's quite another thing when you experience uh, these so-called failures in, in uh, your uh, processes. So again, we cannot take those only one thing, but when it comes to programs, how, how how to teach, it means for teachers that they are in insecurity because they do not know what happens and they need to handle those situations and they need to support those not working out situations. And, oh, it's... This one. <laughs> but when, I, I still say one thing. When we look at the students today, they, if you look at statistics that say that 70% of companies fail, they, it's not failure. 50 to 70, something between mostly. We call it as a flexible zone. They enter into the market, they leave the market, and students feel uh, that they build their own learning environments by starting businesses. It's not for lifelong commitment. So the world has changed. Our students have changed. Mats, Mats, how would you teach yeah. failures? Oh, it's uh, it's built into our whole system. We 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 see. S it's every year we 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 turn we together with the students terminate things because they simply don't work. There's no market or the technology doesn't work. And what we see then, and the students of course see, is that the second time they they start, they are much quicker in getting their 
getting up and 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 getting their uh, you know getting their team together. So so they see when they do repetitive, uh, well, uh, when they have to restart, it, it's a great uh, way to see. Wow, how, look how much we've learned. The trouble that's been most difficult for me has been dysfunctional teams. So we got some teams simply cannot get get. Uh, themselves to work there's all and and it's very very difficult to 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 have a team that's having a negative spiral to, to flip it the Karen runs that and have so many talks with them I do as well historically and we've we've wrapped our heads around it thank God we now can see that even teams that were dysfunctional for a whole year and we have them you have well, people coming back say I learned so much I know exactly how to avoid this now and I'm so happy that I had this really hard situation so so even when you ha when it sucks and you hate each other almost uh, it, they still have learned something and and the the learning that then I once again I perhaps should emphasize is that when you look at innovation it's very often a true partnership between at least two or three persons that are very different that really needs to click so that you, that innovation-based you, is, is very thick. That's why teams are so, so, so important. I don't see single entrepreneurs ever. So that they need to get that, but sometimes uh, the tough part has been to see how they, they are dysfunctional. We give them all the time, and we find ways to get them out, and they get their grade and everything, but you feel sad, you know. You are always saying that, uh, that learning from failures are, are important, yeah. but what do we learn from failures that we can't uh, learn from successes? You don't know because you need to experience failure before. Um, but I think also that failure is something that can, I mean, how we treat, how we uh, consider failure. Because as Paula said, not all failures are entrepreneurial failure. But we need to distinguish between business failure and entrepreneurial failure. And not all failures lead to learning. I think. There are more, I mean, Seat Kings is talking about um, learning from small failures, the intelligent failures. That's mean taking small, small steps where you can reflect upon what didn't went well and you can adjust that. So I think that is also something that we can uh, introduce. And also Sarasvati is talking about the affordable loss principle. I think that is also very, very useful to to have included uh, during the processes. Magnus, what's the, what are we learning from failures? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Paula, what are we learning from failures? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will come back. <laughs> no? I will come back to Paula. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we try to over under what is it, over avoid over dramatization of failure. I mean, of merk of I we say in Swedish. I mean, it's not a really big thing. I mean, it's just a natural part of the entrepreneurial process, you know. And everything we do is a big risk of failing, you know. And uh, I think, um, as I write in 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 the course uh, uh, aim, you know, the, the mission behind this course is to provide a toolbox that will help you. But also inspiring you, you know. So I mean, uh, it's it's um, for me, it's not a really big thing. I mean, it's, it's a natural part of the education. If you start with saying to the students that one or three thousand will be a success case, you know, be a, a growth company or a very successful entrepreneur with with uh, with a huge amount of money, you know, it's like putting um, water on the fire, isn't it? I mean, it's not a good start of a course, is it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I, somebody said I don't know who said that one tenth of the students they like role models like Steve and Bill and Ingvar to come and inspire, mm -hmm. but nine out of ten they like to meet someone that's pretty much like them and hear their troubles and their worries. So the absolute majority of, of entrepreneurship students they want to at least be able to link up to perhaps alumni and others and listen to their troubles and learn from that and, and then it's de dramatized as you said mm -hmm. uh, so so be careful hyping it too much with, and don't don't please the the 10 percent too much with too much success cases actually try to build it into a natural community thing with role models that people can relate to i think is my answer paula coming back to you what can we learn from mistakes oh 
we can learn to manage, but for some, they can learn to success. And that my point is that for some, uh, when they failure, it's no big deal at all, but for some, it's a huge yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Even though it can be exactly the same uh, mm -hmm. failure. Mm -hmm. So that is something that th as teachers, I don't know how to deal with other than we accept that our students are different. And I think these cultural issues you were talking about and has been talked mm -hmm. a lot today, mm -hmm. that is uh, one thing. Uh, to accept and to consider also. Mm. So unfortunately, it means that there are not m mass lectures, but there are individuals mm. 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 that are different mm. at the same time. I think time. that's also very important because you, you need to see the individual. It's difficult to do when you have 150 students in front of you. But when you're ri running an entrepreneurship training program where you are 20, I mean, I can see, I mean, we have been running this for 25 years. We have over 2,000 people thinking about it. We have started 500 companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and 50 growth companies. So it's a big su success that in that way, too. But but you see that what's coming out very often when it comes to to, uh, to what was the benefit, from, in your point of view, from, from the program, I was seen as an entrepreneur by the coach, by the mentor, by everyone in the program, you know. So, I mean, I... I, I I was something, mm -hmm. and and uh, I think that is. I mean, you can't do so much in four to six months, you know. I mean, it's a very small mm -hmm. part of your life, but I'm very happy to see that when it comes out. Mats? No, I would no. totally agree. And, mm -hmm. and Karen has written about you know using positioning theory. It's about mm -hmm. positioning yourself and mm -hmm. saying I want to be, but it's as much also getting that confirmation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. once you have that in place, mm -hmm. well, then you are an entrepreneur. Boom. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's it's about that mm -hmm. process. Then I uh, think we open up for questions. We have mm -hmm. since long have one question here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait for the microphone. Uh, yeah, I uh, just wanted to hear with you. How do we get time, or do we have time in our courses and programs to really reflect afterwards? Sometimes I feel like the students should perform so much and then it's the last day and they have performed that they have uh, handled in everything and they get the degree and then they come back you say months they afterwards and say I learned so much but how could we find time to have that discussion before the courses ends and uh, to share our uh, reflections to learn from each other's mistakes to let them make mistakes and then have reflections and learn from them together is it possible to not have the last day as just mm -hmm. performing mm -hmm. and get your degree and then mm -hmm. it's over and then you have to think about it at home? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, one way is, is to write learning journal or mm -hmm. diaries, mm -hmm. uh, which they write each week. Mm -hmm. And also they have the time to reflect upon it. But that is more individual reflection. You were asking about the collective, yeah. And I think wha one way we do in the program is that we have these uh, sessions, evaluation workshop sessions, where we talk about what was the most important thing within the different kind of courses. How did that add to your knowledge uh, of, of entrepreneurship and what, what was less valuable and how could it be changed during the, the process? And that I think it's, has been really, really uh, beneficial for us that are involved in the program, but also for the students that are uh, enrolled. I think that is one way of having this workshops discussion during the, the education. We have two, one in, in the midterm and then in, in, the, in the end. It's a dream factory. Uh, I mean, we don't have the time and the resources to do that, especially when you have a low, um, huge amount of students taking part. I have a very simple thing I do. I, I go with coffee break. I, I try to be there and talk to them in the coffee break. Of course, there's a very limitation about that, you know, but it's a very simple thing to do. I mean, talk to them uh, when they are relaxed, you know, and you get, you get some input and people coming to you and talking, you know, so I mean, it, that is a very simple way of doing it. But sitting down with 150 students and start talking what you like without this course. You know, I know that, for instance, I'm meeting a lot of technical students, uh, technical physics, technical physics and so on. And, and sorry, Mats. <laughs> uh, and you know that that is like a like a normal uh, normal f uh, curve. You know, I mean, you have twenty percent are very positive. They just love what you do, what you do. And you have a big uh, group in the m in the middle that that, that uh, 
indifferent, you know, it could be something. And then you have a group of, of very, very negative. You can just see on the body language, we hate what you are doing there, you know. And, and, and it's very difficult to, to, to get over that, you know. And these are also writing all these negative things about you in the free answers on the co course observation. You know? <laughs> this was the most baddest uh, 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 course I ever taken, you know. But as you said also, some are, some people coming back, you know, they got a job at Ericsson. I won the inventor prize at Ericsson. A guy for me just can we have lunch because I can contribute to the course. And I got so happy. I don't know if, if he was one of the twenty percent. <laughs> but in, in but I mean if you want yeah. them to fail during yeah. the course and then yeah. talk about it, mm -hmm. how do we find time yeah. to do that? Uh, it's difficult. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, it's a great question, and oh, yeah. they they as I, yeah. we spoke in the fika when we had a reflection <laughs> <laughs> that they always land on their feet in the end because I think it's because they feel they're they're about to be examined and then they have become much more talkative. Before that, they really want to be action oriented, and it's not always easy to have them appreciating all kinds of reflective. <coughs> instruments, to be honest. Um, so that's so. It's I think it's a challenge. The the the, the biggest ethical uh, insight I got about our program was after a few years we realized that the, some of them came back and said, you know, you you have you must you have initiated something. We are we have we are so much into this entrepreneurship. We need a voice. We need to come back and be able to talk. So what we did then was that we started more like an alumni association and made sure that we are having a lifelong ecosystem kind of relationship with them. Because I don't think we can ask everybody to start reflecting. That's my point. But they will. We have initiated something. Mm -hmm. And by making us available uh, and, and also making sure that they are good at coaching each other, of course, it's even better. Uh, so that's the answer. We I have think. another question. Hmm? Um, my question is about assessment and failure. How do you, how do you assess? Uh, how do you decide on a grade, especially when you have the uh, student with the um, negative attitude or the group uh, that's dysfunctional and still you're saying, well, you can still get top grade if you are in a dysfunctional group. How do you work with that? Should you want to? Uh, I think the one that would like to answer. That is uh, something that we all experience, but how do yeah. we? So, so uh, in, in the end, it's, n it's only a pass fail when you have a master thesis. That helps a lot, to be honest, because that's when you have the dysfunctional teams. Mm. Um, so that's one question. I guess we should take a few <laughs> other examples. <laughs> I think yeah. there are two challenges. It's very important uh, what you said about how to evaluate. And I think that reflection is, is one mm -hmm. tool for that and how to gather it throughout the process mm. uh, in order to help them to see what happens. The other one is a challenge to all of us because in higher education we are used to provide courses. But now we should provide processes, mm. how to develop competencies. Mm. And it means that then we have a several courses we can talk about these failures and what we learn and then go forward and consider that. It's not easy to have these process-oriented programs. It's much easier to provide those uh, uh, individual courses. And so I believe it's a challenge to all of us how to do that. I think time is starting to run out, but I think you or Kim might have the uh, final questions. I might have the microphone. Yeah, 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 yeah I see that. I see that. You are Kim Wimbo, a colleague to Diamant. I'm uh, director of the corporate entrepreneurship track. I, I think the discussion about learning from failure is very interesting and I really enjoy that. But I think what I was lacking is sort of what concretely do we mean by failure. And I think one idea that I have is that I think it's important in order to learn from failure, if you use that word, uh, to have the students explicitly uh, state their assumptions when they start a venture, for example, in a program. What's your assumptions about what value you assume to deliver to your potential customers? What are the customers? Are you sort of the end consumers, business to consumer or to companies? What's the value worth for this customer in terms of price? And then 
get out and try and get feedback from customers and so on. And okay, I was wrong in my assumptions, and that's a good learning, but I would not call it failure. Your assumptions was not correct, and you learn a lot from, I think, having the students explicitly state assumptions and then out and try and then go back and see what went wrong and then share that learning and, and sort of instance assumptions with the others how do you look upon that because i think failure i don't like that word more about sort of make explicit your assumptions and perhaps you're wrong in assumptions so then mm -hmm. correct totally. our panelists um, magnus uh, I, I try to understand <laughs> your question but i i, I think it's 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 um, why are things not turning up in the end as it was planned, maybe, or something? Uh, we, we know something about that because we're following our, we have a lot of cases, you know, and it, I have a very simple, re simple answer, social reasons. Things didn't turn up as it was thought to be, you know. Especially in teams when, when, when you're, you're in a young age, you know, I mean, somebody is uh, traveling to China or, 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 or setting up a, uh, something else or, 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 or they are just getting a conflict in the group, you know, it has nothing to do with financial things or something like that. It, it's, it's much more social things and also lack of determination. I mean, utålighet, as we say in Swedish, I mean, persistence. persistence. Uh, it's also very common. I mean, it's, it's not a big dramatical economical failure. <laughs> It's a social thing, uh, most of the cases, I would say. Yeah. Any comments? More mm -hmm. comments? I can totally agree mm -hmm. with you, Joachim, mm -hmm. that we have quite mm. negative view of fail and what mm. it really is consisted of. Mm. I think my, my, my personal view is to fail is to fall short of expected outcomes. Mm. Uh, and if, if we look upon this as a, a, as a process that they are going through, even if they are team-based or individual, they are setting goals and if these goals are not fulfilled in some sense they need to adjust that and I think that part also mm. includes some learning uh, issue mm. and also to adjust that to go further on so I think that could be seen as yes. critical setbacks during the process that could also be uh, equalized to failure or what we could say yeah. Drawbacks. Um, I agree. I agree. Okay. It's, uh, I agree with you as well. It's, okay. you know, that's the word learning. Yeah. Failure is the wrong word. It's about learning. Yeah. Okay. Time is running out, and uh, I first of all will see this as an input for the dinner conversations tonight. Uh, I will thank the the panelists for good discussions and good uh, answers to all the questions that we have received. So I will give you. Uh, uh, applaud for your contribution in that respect. Thank you. <laughs>